Real Price is a, um, yeah, hold your pauses. I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. Thank you, thank you. He's a, he's a serial entrepreneur and he's a social entrepreneur, okay? He's, he's been working um, on many different projects. He's, he's launched eight startups uh, before he left school and he's, he's done many, many different things. Uh, at the age of 25, he launched uh, Blueprint, Manage Blueprint Management Group with $5,000 in capital and, you know, uh, what, 10 years later, sold it for over 100 million. Okay, so he, he knows what he's talking about. So we've got a really good speaker here to, uh, you know, share some knowledge with us. So without further ado, please make welcome Creole Price. When I heard about it, I, I couldn't believe it was actually happening in Sydney. So I uh, put my hand up and said, I'd, I'd love to be involved. And then, uh, and then Trevor said, well, you know, would you, would you mind uh, doing the opening address? Your, your job will be to inspire everyone. So I think I've actually got the easiest job in the next 48 hours because the fact that you're here at 7 o'clock on a Friday night instead of at the pub, I, I figured you're, you're probably pretty inspired already. But So um, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll share a little bit of, about my own personal journey, but one of the things that I, w I want to start with is, is really you guys are standing on the precipice of, 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 a, of a massive change that's going on in the world where we, where we are starting to combine business uh, with social good. And, and, and social enterprise is really where that all starts. So I've never, never seen it happen over the uh, course of 48 hours, but, it, but I'm, I'm excited to actually hear what the results are going to be. So, uh, so I, I, I think it's going to be a, a pretty interesting uh, journey that you're all going to go through. Some of you are obviously in business already. Some of you um, maybe have never started business. Who's, who's never been in business before, had their own, um, had their own business? A few of you guys. Well, I, I think there's, there's nothing more exciting than actually the first time you actually get into business. So you guys are going to be in for a, a pretty exciting ride as well. Well, my, uh, my, my first business started uh, at the ripe old age of 11. I found myself um, the, uh, the strawberry baron of western New South Wales. I, um, I, I grew up in, um, in Cara on a little farm. And at the age of 11, I, uh, I started my own strawberry business. And it all, and it all started with a, with a goal. I, I wanted to, uh, to buy my own uh, computer. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't any old computer. It was one of these little fan-dangled machines called a, uh, a Commodore 64. Anyone have a Commodore 64? Maybe you guys are a bit young for this. But um, it, was a, it was a pretty amazing bit of machinery. It, uh, it had 64,000 kilobytes of memory, you know. I think, I think the average mobile phone has about 10,000 times that. That's how much things have changed since I was a kid. But, but, we, but even, even so, it enabled us to play some pretty cool things. We could play uh, Ghostbusters and, and do real-life moves like Bruce Lee and that sort of stuff. <laughs> after, we'd, uh, after we'd waited the, uh, the three-quarters of an hour for it to, to load up on our tape deck. And uh, mo most, most, most people in the audience uh, look like Gen Ys. You're probably going, what's our tape deck? Well, it's one of, uh, one of those. So these days things are a little bit easier. But anyway, in order for me to, uh, to be able to afford to buy a computer, I realised that uh, because the family farm was going through a pretty severe drought at the time, it was going to be pretty much up to me. So I hatched this plan with my younger brother that we would uh, send away for 500 strawberry plants and we'd plant them and, and, and sell them beside the highway. And so we, uh, so we sent away for them and and sure enough, you know, these, these strawberries turn into these most luscious, beautiful, sweet strawberries you could ever imagine. And an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old sitting beside the highway, you can imagine they sold out like hotcakes. So not only did I get to buy my Commodore 64, but I, I got a, a new set of golf clubs and a, uh, and a record player where I got to play my very first LPs, which were, um, it says a bit about my music taste, I think, was uh, Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell and uh, Kenny Rogers' Greatest Hits, which I think... Uh, a lot of those would go straight over your head, but it, um, the, um, that, with that early taste of entrepreneurial success, the, the following year I decided to increase production and I sent away for 3,000 strawberry plants and, and I did a, a deal with my school bus driver. We lived, um, it used to take an hour and a half each morning and each afternoon to get to school, but I did a deal with the bus driver that I hooked up all the fruit shops around town. If I had the strawberries picked and packed by 7.30 in the morning when the bus picked me up, in return for strawberries, my bus driver would deliver them to all of the, uh, all of the shops around town, right? And that seemed, to, uh, that seemed to work pretty well, and the, the money just kept pouring in. And, and with the family farm still going through a pretty severe drought, the following year I, um, I decided to increase production again, and uh, we put, uh, we'd put 4,000 strawberry plants in, and it became a, uh, an all-encompassing family affair. 
In fact, I think I was the only 13-year-old in my class that could boast that he was employing his parents. The, uh, as, you, as you can imagine, uh, dinner time at the Price household was a constant power struggle. My mum would be like, Creole Price, if you don't eat your greens, you're not getting any sweets. And I'd be going, well, if I don't get any sweets, you can consider yourself fired. <laughs> uh, fortunately, um, God had a, a sense of humour, I think, and um, the next year my whole strawberry patch caught a, a, a pretty... Uh, rampant fungal disease and that was pretty much the end of that but such is the, is the uh, optimism of youth and uh, I'm, I'm seeing it here tonight is I had another seven businesses as Trevor mentioned before I left school and another two at university and um, I guess I've, I've, I've had the, uh, the business bug ever since. I did manage to, uh, to work for a, uh, for a few years in finance, I think it was two and a half years until I saved up enough money to, uh, to put on my backpack and I, I travelled around the world for, for 12 months as uh, some of you probably have and maybe even some of you are still doing. Um, but, but it was a pretty amazing time. And then I found myself in, in Africa. And Africa is a, a pretty amazing place. And I was, uh, I was climbing um, Mount Kilimanjaro in, um, in Africa and, and I, was, I was finding it pretty tough. And one of my, my fellow climbing buddies, uh, it was an English chap, and he handed me this, um, this business biography of, a, of an English entrepreneur I'd never come across before. It was entitled uh, Losing My Virginity. Anyone know, ever read um, Sir Richard Branson's Losing My Virginity? Yeah, so I was, I was getting pretty inspired reading, reading his tales of entrepreneurial endeavour, how he'd started his business at 15 and, and gone on to, to found the Virgin Empire. And I, I thought, you know, um, you know, if Branson could do it, so can I. And which, um, which, which I think I could probably only have come up with climbing a high altitude mountain because you get this thing called mountain altitude sickness which doesn't allow you to think very clearly. But anyway, I set myself the goal, if I could get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, I was going to be a millionaire before I was 30 and I'd set up my own business. So, so that was my goal and, and I managed to get to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, which you know, was pretty hard, but it, as it turned out, it was probably one of the, the easiest part of the, uh, the equation because I, I came back to Australia and I uh, joined forces with, um, with a chap by the name of Trevor Folsom and we threw $5,000 in each and we, we, we founded Blueprint Management Group. With, uh, with more hope than promise. We didn't even know what business we were going to be in other than the fact that we wanted to create the next virgin empire and uh, we wanted to find the formula really of, of, of how to be successful at business. So to cut a very, very long story very, very short, I, um, I did manage to, uh, to build the company up from, uh, from the age of 25. By the, the time I was 30, it, you know, it, was, it was doing pretty well and I, was, uh, you know, I suppose I could say on paper at least I was a millionaire but it was another... Five years or so later, we'd built the company up, and um, my, my passion, I realised, was you know, I love business, but more than that, I, I really love business that makes a difference. So, so I'd, I'd, um, I'd I decided with Trevor that we we're going to sell the business so I could um, concentrate on these endeavours. So, sure enough, uh, we managed to uh, to sell the business, um, as Trevor mentioned, for I think it was 109 million dollars. Managed to uh, to do it three days before Bear Stearns crumbled, which if any of you are familiar with the uh, the writings of the, the global financial crisis, that was pretty much the, the start of when things really started to go bad. So we were pretty, pretty lucky in that regard. And, um, and I guess since uh, retiring from business, what I've been involved in is, um, is a lot of social enterprise and it revolves around this concept I have called uh, the entrepreneurs, which is really a, a 21st century renaissance inspired by entrepreneurial thinking. And it's, it's all about reviving these, uh, these six things, which is change and meaning and fulfilment and freedom, community and legacy. And without going into those in any detail, for me it's social enterprise is the thing that actually combines all six of those in, in, the, in the best way. And so I thought I'd share with you now a little bit about social enterprise and, and, and why I'm involved and, and, um, and, and what it's all about. So for me the, the future of business is this concept of uh, social enterprise where we're combining commerce with charity. Okay. And I think if we can really start to harness the, the entrepreneurial spirit, not only in Australia but around the world and particularly in third world countries, we are going to really make a, make a massive difference. So the, the endeavours that I've been involved in since, um, since business, I guess one of the first initiatives was um, I was contracted by the government actually in, in partnership with the Kokoda Track Foundation to, to set up microfinance and micro businesses along the Kokoda Track. You know, there's 4,000... Aussies every year trek the Kokoda track, but they're so head down, um, backpack on, just um, just getting through the walk. They don't actually engage with the uh, with the locals, which is a, which is a pretty sad thing. So we were engaged with the government to um, to try and create uh, businesses along the track, which um, 
which sounds like a pretty amazing initiative, but it's, it's probably harder than you think because not only they did, didn't speak English, most of them didn't actually speak pidgin that our interpreter spoke. So we had to translate it into pidgin and then have someone else to translate it into each of the local dialects, which were different along the track. So, so that, was, that was a pretty in, um, uh, interesting initiative. The next uh, thing that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about is not only uh, getting the third world into business, but um, to get kids into business. Because I, I think if you can turn on that spark at a really young age, um, as, as, it, as it did for me, you can, you can really make a massive difference. So I, um, I founded a thing about three years ago called the, the Club Kidpreneur Foundation, and we inspire eight to 12 year olds to, uh, to do business. And we've, we've got a program which we run in, uh, run in after school care, and we run a camp now as well. We've, We've worked with over 45 schools and over 1,000 kids, and uh, I think we've, we've had 12 market days. But it's, it's, it's such an inspiring thing to be around because we, we have about 50 old volunteer mentors. Anyone wants to, uh, wants to be involved in this, we'd love to have you. But what's actually happened is the kids are actually teaching the mentors about business, which is, uh, which is quite an interesting thing that we didn't actually think about. Because sometimes if you really simplify business down into its simplest form, you're going to be more successful, right? And I think that's probably a lesson that you need to start to think about with your own social enterprises here tonight is how do you make things simple as possible, okay? We had, a, we had one, one little kid came through, the, uh, came through the program and I think he was only eight years of age and he, um, he decided he wanted to sell um, paper airplanes at our, at our market and said one of our mentors that was, that was doing that particular program said, oh, mate, uh, you know, I'm not sure that paper airplanes are such a good idea because, you know, it's mostly adults at this market so, you know, there's really going to be no one want to buy paper airplanes. Maybe you should come up with something else. And, and the kid said, no, mate. Uh, he said, I've, I'm, I'm committed. I'm going to build paper airplanes. And one of the things we, we, we encourage the mentors to do is allow the kids to fail if that's what happens. Because, you know, in some ways, some businesses are successful, some aren't. So he goes, you know, good luck with that kid. So the kid turns up to market day with these 30 beautifully manicured paper planes that he's coloured up and everything. And Seb's shaking his head thinking, oh, you know, this is going to end in disaster. But sure enough... Uh, the kid sells, uh, the first half an hour, the, s the kid sells 20 paper airplanes. He's selling them for a dollar each or three for three dollars. And he's, uh, he's, he's doing pretty well. So Seb thought, you know, may maybe I should, uh, should help this kid out with a bit of business advice. So he said, kid, you may maybe you should put your prices up because, you, you know, it's another two hours at the markets and you only got 10 planes. And the kid said, no, nah, mate. He said, I've got a different idea. He's obviously an entrepreneurial kid, this one. So he came up with this idea where instead of uh, selling his planes, he decided to lease them instead. And he came up with this game where he drew a big target and he charged people a dollar a go that if they hit the target, they got to keep the plane. But of course, no one did. And he, uh, he, he stretched, his, uh, stretched his planes all the rest of the market. But uh, some, some pretty cool stuff happens in the, uh, in, the, in the program. In fact, we've just done a, done a program not, not too far from here in Everly with some Aboriginal kids. And it's, um, it's quite amazing when you, when you speak to some kids that, that maybe aren't academically talented, maybe they're not s talented in sport or music or arts, business can be one of those things they're absolutely talented at. And if you can turn on it at a young enough age, you can really make a difference. One of the kids in that program, he'd, he'd tried to commit suicide uh, three times within the last 12 months and he was, he, was, he was diagnosed with depression and he didn't go to school that much. But after doing the program, we got an email from his, from his mum to say that that he was, he was an absolutely different kid after this program, that he, he, was, he could go to school, and not only could he go to school, he could stand up in front of the class with confidence and start to speak again. And he's kept his little business going. He's, he's got a little hot dog business, and he's kept it going. And, and um, it's, it's just an amazing thing for a little kid like that, that that didn't think he had a lot of hope, that all of a sudden business has created that hope for him. But one of the other uh, enterprises I've been involved in is, uh, is One Water which some of you may have, may have heard of before. One Water essentially, we, we sell a bottle of water and 100% of our profits go to fund one of these things, a, uh, a play pump. Essentially, a play pump works. We put them in schoolyards in Africa, and as the kids play around on the merry-go-round, the water gets pumped out of the ground into a holding tank. So instead of the kids having to spend six hours a day collecting water, they get to, to, uh, to go and get an education. And so, uh, so since, um, since being involved in that organisation, it was actually founded by uh, Paul Robinson, the very same guy who handed me Richard Branson's biography all those years ago. And he asked me if I'd help it bring it to Australia, which, which we did. But we've raised over uh, $5 million now for, um, for, uh, for play pumps, and we put 1,000 of these in, uh, in schoolyards in Africa. So I think there's, there's close to nearly a million people affected uh, through this initiative alone. And, and that's, that's a social enterprise. You know, we're a business, but 100% of our profits uh, do, do, do good. Well... Where this story ends, I guess, is, um, is Richard Branson was at a dinner in, um, or a luncheon in, um, in, in New York and he, he ran into one of our directors and he was, he was getting pretty inspired by this concept of, of, of social enterprise. So he said, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great to, uh, 
to get some of the uh, those social inter- uh, entrepreneurs from around the world to um, together on my island to discuss the future of philanthropy. And um, Duncan Goose, the CEO of One Water at the time in the UK, was was invited. Unfortunately for Duncan, he was uh, he was having a baby that week. So instead of instead of Duncan as the chairman in Australia, I was the one that actually managed to get to go. So I was. I headed over to, uh, to Necker Island in the Caribbean to meet my, uh, the hero that inspired me to get into business. Um, and we spent five days with 20 other social entrepreneurs from around the world. And it was, it was just such an amazing time. But to spend that time with Richard, when, when I thought, you know, he was probably going to blow in an hour a day or something rather. But we, we, were, we were doing Pilates at six o'clock in the morning with him and still drinking at the bar at midnight. And it was, it was such an amazing thing. But I, of course, um, was in his ear the whole time about training entrepreneurs and, and that sort of stuff. And... And he shared with me that he'd started a foundation in, the, in South Africa called the Branson Centre for Entrepreneurship where they, they really needed some more help to take it to the next level. So he asked if I, if I would help out. So, so I sort of said, you know, you've twisted my arm. So, so 18 months ago, I was over in Africa four times and, um, and, and now I'm proud to say that the curriculum for the Branson Centre for Entrepreneurship is actually run by, um, run by my curriculum where I train entrepreneurs here in Australia. There's, there's a little uh, photo of some of the, the entrepreneurs I... Uh, 18 months ago, I ran a, um, a, a five-day boot camp at a, at a little game park up in um, north, of, uh, north of Johannesburg. Because one of the issues that we have in training these 18 to 25-year-old youths that, that mostly come out of townships, they, don't really, they haven't really had a proper education. So trying to teach entrepreneurship in the classroom is, is a real ha- uphill battle. So we've devised this program where they actually learn it very experientially. So when they're learning about business models, we... We give them the metaphor of it's just like uh, creating your own recipe when you're cooking, you know. So you could grab your grandmother's recipe, which is like the franchise, which you can follow when you're cooking a nice dish. Or you could come up with your own recipe with just experimenting a little bit of this, a little bit of that, until you come up with And then you can start to leverage yourself, get other people to use that same recipe. So to drive that point home, we had a master chef competition in these little open fires in, uh, in this game park. And, and we did orienteering and painting. And, and one of the last activities we did was, uh, was climbing a mountain. My philosophy of business is that as business is very similar to, uh, to climbing a high altitude mountain, that you really need to, to get the vision or, or your goal of, of what you want to achieve and you just can't stop until you actually get there. Well, to drive that point home, I, there was a little, a little mountain not too far from the game park, so I, I, I took the brave move of, of, of taking these 20 uh, entrepreneurs up this, uh, up this mountain. But halfway up, I was starting to get a bit nervous. It was starting to look a bit dangerous and I could just see newspapers from all around the world with Richard Branson's name on it that he'd killed all these entrepreneurs. So, so I said to the guys, I said, well, you, you stay here and I'll go and see if the, um, the coast is clear. So I ran up the top of this mountain and it wasn't too bad, but on the way down, because I was rushing, I slipped in what was called a baboon slide and, um, and fell about 25 metres and completely shattered my ankle. And, um, which wasn't good when you're in the middle of a training course, of course. So, uh, so I, uh, I called all the entrepreneurs together and, and managed to convince them to go up to the top and, and come down very safely with a message of the hardest thing they'll ever do in business is, um, is, is the su- succession, um, which is pretty true of mountaineering. Most, most ac- accidents happen on the way down as well, but that gave me enough time to, uh, to recover. And, and by the time they came down a few hours later, I was, I was back in consciousness and, and they split themselves into three teams and uh, one team uh, you know, managed to get me down the mountain. The other team was charged with the, with the job of getting me across this uh, about 50 metre wide river. And by this stage, the other team had uh, built a stretcher and carried me the seven kilometres back to uh, safety. But it ended up being a business lesson that I'll never forget and I'm, cert- I'm sure they, ha- they haven't uh, forgotten it either. Well, this, this little exploit managed to, uh, managed to get me in, uh, in Richard's latest book, which is something I'd, I'd encourage all of you to read if... If losing my virginity was what inspired me to get into business, I think screw business as usual is, is really a tomb of, um, there's, there's one there, of, of social entrepreneurship. He talks about lots of different initiatives around the world that uh, are pretty inspiring. In fact, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say he's, he's chatted a bit about um, some of the initiatives I've been involved in. My, um, I'm going to, uh, to give Trevor a couple of copies of my book. It's actually launched uh, this week, uh, The One Thing to Win at the Game of Business. So, Trevor, when someone does something... Uh, Something amazing this weekend. Um, there's, there's, there's two copies for you to, um, to to give away as you see fit. But where I want to finish this uh, this presentation is, I guess, where it all started in, in, in climbing a mountain for me. This was a little quote we had on our uh, on our wall in uh, Blueprint My Business to help remind us that uh, of the job that we had ahead of us. And it goes like this: that the more obstacles conquered, the more inspiring the view. Strive for greatness. Well. Trevor asked me to, uh, to share my, my three things to keep you inspired over the course of this weekend. And I think 
for me, it's, it's, it's really the learnings out of that quote, which are firstly that we need to, uh, to enjoy the challenge. Okay, you are going to come across challenges and you need to make sure that you smile in the face of adversity because that's what business is all about, okay? If it was easy, someone would have already got there before you. The next, uh, the next point is that you need, to, um, you need to celebrate your success, okay? You need to, at each of those milestones on this weekend or even in the, the greater journey in making that, that business a reality is you need to make sure that it's not all about going forward. You need to, to look back and appreciate the view and that's something that I think a lot of uh, business people can learn from as well. And lastly, the, uh, the, the top tip to keep you inspired is I think you do need to, uh, to aim for something extraordinary. If, if it's ordinary, you're not going to be able to, to keep it going when you're starting to lose motivation. But if, if it is something that is truly going to make a massive impact on the planet, that's, w that's the purpose that's going to keep you inspired. So hopefully some of those things um, ring true for each of you and I, uh, I really wish you uh, all the best with, uh, with the weekend. <laughs>